Boys, 94.4% accuracy in the Karo Khan. That was, like, actually perfect. Like, accuse me of being a cheater. Obviously, I'm not cheating. You heard me explain why I was playing my moves, but... Whoa! That, that was an amazing game. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 15 of the Karo Khan vs. Everything series. In this series, we play one 15-minute plus 10 second rapid game on chess.com. And regardless of whether I have the white or the black pieces, we play a Karo Khan-esque setup. If you want to see the previous episodes of this series, there'll be a playlist linked down below. But with that being said, let's get into the game. All right, then. We are going to, going to have our opponent abort the game and search for a new one where my opponent will play. And we're going to get a Karo Khan proper against Mr. Taurus23 from... I think that's Malaysia. No, it's the Philippines. I think I mix up Malaysia and the Philippines quite often. I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe they're right next to each other. Anyway, my opponent goes f4. And this is actually a viable move if he now pushes e5. Which I expect him to do. Otherwise, it doesn't really make any sense. You're just preemptively waiting for me to go d5. So that you can push e5 with support. He doesn't do that. So that is really strange. Because what I think is going to happen is if he goes d4, he's going to leave a massive hole on the e4 square for me to put a knight on and probably put a bishop on f5 to secure very, very nicely. My opponent goes knight f3. We're going to go knight c6. You could play bishop g4. Um, but knight to c6 accomplishes a similar task because it controls the squares that his knight is trying to control, if you see what I mean. My opponent goes bishop b5, so he now pins my knight. Bishop g4 is the move that I want to play to counter pin him, so he can't do anything like knight to e5 or knight to d4 to pressure my pinned knight. It wouldn't be the end of the world. We could do something like knight f6, and if knight e5, just play bishop to d7. But, uh, I don't know. I think bishop g4 makes a lot of sense because I also want to play the move e6 but I want to develop my bishop first. There are ideas as well if my opponent castles of queen b6 check which would attack the king and attack the bishop because the bishop is undefended. So we'll see what he does. We have to be careful this knight can't move with some kind of check to pick up the bishop. That often happens when there's a bishop on c4. In um, some Karo Khan lines where you end up taking on e4, like you take with your d-pawn, and then they put like a bishop on c4, and then like they take, king takes, and knight e5, and you lose a bishop, <clears throat> and they obviously get a pawn in the process. But that's not what happens, so we don't have to worry about that. My opponent goes c3, and I assume he's intending a move like queen to a4 to break this pin and put more pressure on my knight. We could go queen b6 to attack the bishop and stop him from castling. After something like queen b6, queen a4, we could take this knight, double his pawns, and then just play a simple move like e6 or rook c8 to prepare a6. Although, oh no, that would be fine because our queen defends the a7 pawn. We have a few options. We have a few options. My only concern with playing moves like queen b6 and rook c8 is that I really want to develop my kingside pieces so that I can castle. If we play a move like e6, let's say, queen a4, then there's a bit of an issue because I can't take the knight because he'll take on c6 with check. And my bishop is being blocked by this pawn from helping. So what I need to do is make sure this knight is defended first. We could do it by queen b6 or rook c8. Um, oh, and also the issue is if um, e6, queen a4, and we don't take the knight, we play a move like queen b6, then he can play knight to e5 with a double attack on my bishop and my knight. So it's a bit of a problem. Therefore, I think queen b6 is the logical move. I think this makes a lot of sense. We're just attacking the bishop, defending a7, defending the knight. Defending b7 could be useful as well. Because obviously our bishop has stepped away from the defense of the b7 pawn, which can often become a bit of a target for white in these Karo and Slav positions. 
A4 was a move I didn't consider, but I don't think it's anything to be worried about because he can't push A5 because his bishop will hang. And he also can't castle because uh, we're stopping it. I assume he's going to play a move like D4, but I think we can play like Knight F6. And then if D4, we always have Knight E4 on the cards because like I said, this F4 move not only weakens this diagonal, but also weakens the E4 square massively if he moves his pawn to d4, which I think he kind of has to do, otherwise I don't know how he's going to castle. We could go a6 to ask this bishop a question, but the thing is, if he takes, I mean, we've wasted a move going a6, I think, and he could also retreat to e2 to help support this knight. Honestly, I think we'd just be helping him by playing a6. So I'm going to continue development on the king side. Again, a5 doesn't work because we'll take the bishop. If he takes the knight, we'll just take back with the pawn, and a5 is not really a concern. We can put our queen on, you know, just c7 or something nice and safe. And we'll, you know, have a very strong center with pawns on c6, d5, and we'll put the other pawn on e6. I'm quite liking this position. My opponent has played a very strange line with f4. I really did think after f4, d5, he had to go e5. I thought that was the entire idea. But apparently not. Okay, my opponent goes knight to a3, which is interesting because he can't come to c4 and he can't come to b5. Even if my opponent vacates the b5 square by taking my knight, I'm just going to take back with the pawn to maintain control over b5. So again, a6 isn't necessary. The only other reason I could see for playing knight a3 is to go knight to c2. Maybe supporting a c4 push? But that looks wrong. If he goes back to c2, I mean, you know, maybe he wants to come to e3 to challenge my bishop, something like that. But that's a very long-winded maneuver. That's a lot of time wasted. I think we can just play something like e6, maybe bishop c5, bishop d6. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, again, I don't really want to play a6. I feel like there's no need. I suppose one positive of playing f4 is that he doesn't have to play d4 to control the e5 square, because I would have loved to play e5 considering this knight is pinned, but this pawn controls the square. And obviously my knight is pinned, so I don't control the square. But yeah, it's much more like intuitive to have this pawn back on f2 and this pawn on d4, because this diagonal is incredibly weak. Okay, I think I see the reason for knight to a3 now. And it it's kind of weird. I think he's literally just trying to defend his bishop so that he can play a5 and I can't take it. Very, very odd. Because this c pawn, if he goes d4, will become so weak. I also think I can just play a move like a5 and really cause some issues. Or I could go a6 because a5 can always be met with queen a7 to stay on this diagonal. But I think a5 is more accurate. So I'm going to play that. And the b4 pawn is very tender. Like, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of pressure on it. You know, the knight and the queen currently aren't pressuring it because the bishop pins the knight and blocks the queen's vision. We still have two attackers, and if situation has changed, then we could get more. There's a good chance he has to take me, which, I don't know, it looks kind of dubious. I feel like I should be taking with the rook. To keep my queen on this diagonal. But again, I do kind of want to put my rook on c8. So I don't know. Maybe a5 wasn't the best move. I could take with the queen and allow him to castle. But I don't see why I would want to let him do that. Hmm, interesting. If takes and rook takes, is rook b1 a problem? Um... I could always just play something like queen c5 and d4 he would hang the c-pawn. Oh, he takes. Okay, I think this makes my life very, very easy now. Of course, we're going to take back with the pawn because I want to keep an eye on the b5 square and not let the knight in. Um, We could take with the queen, but then he castles and is, mm, I guess, it's a bit easier for him. Rook takes looks more natural to me, especially because rook c8 isn't really a move I care about anymore. 
because we no longer have an open C file to target the C3 pawn once D4 is played. D4 has to be played at some point because he can't block this diagonal with his knight and he needs to block this diagonal so that he can castle because I'm preventing him from doing so. And queen takes would allow castling. It's probably still fine for me. I mean, I could just take on a4. Actually, I could just take on a4. And we would also be targeting the f4 pawn because uh, the d-pawn hasn't moved yet, so the bishop doesn't defend the square. So something like queen a5, castles, queen a4, queen a4, rook a4, knight e5. Ah, no, we can't take it because the rook will be defending it. Okay, okay. Um, queen takes castles, queen takes, queen takes, rook takes, knight e5. He's attacking c6 and he's attacking my bishop. Not sure I love that. Rook a5, rook b1, rook queen a7 to guard the b8 and b7 squares. We are threatening to take a4 still. Um, his knight's also pressured. The knight can only really go to c2. We can bring this bishop out to c5 to get even more control over this diagonal. Although he does just play d4, so maybe bishop to d6 in castles is better. Very interesting. But we will have really big pressure on the a4 pawn. And it's tough to kick my rook out as well. So I'm going to take with the rook. I'm not sure if this was the best approach or not. But it feels good. It feels good. Also, bishop d6 will control the b8 square, which is useful. Again, my queen goes to a7, not only to stay on this diagonal, but also to prevent this rook from infiltrating my position. Because... You know, I don't want to allow it. He could go queen b3, I suppose. That is a move I didn't consider, trying to play queen to b8. Queen b3, I would like to take this knight. But queen b8, queen b8, rook b8, king d7. You can just take. Although maybe I can take the knight there, and then if he... Takes my rook, then I take his bishop, and he hasn't had, he hasn't had time to castle, so his rook won't be defending the bishop. Very interesting position. Queen b3. We can also consider bishop to d6, guarding the b8 square. And if he tries to do something like queen b7, we can just go queen b7, rook b7, bishop f3, pawn f3, rook a4. Interesting. Taking looks good to me. It does. Because I don't want to allow a move like knight e5. That's quite uncomfortable. Bishop f3. If he takes back, then just bishop d6 and we're fine. Um, if queen b7, queen b7, rook b7, we can just take on a4 or we can castle. We have loads of different things we can do. I'm just realizing if we take on a4, we will be threatening this knight a lot. But if we take on a4, uh, queen b8, queen b8, rook b8, king d7. The bishop is kind of pinned to the rook, and then he can play a move like knight e5 check. I don't like that. So I think we should get rid of this knight asap. I think we should just get rid of it, because knight e5 is kind of scary. He does take, that's kind of surprising. So bishop d6 is the move that I want to play, to stop this queen from coming to b8 now. We could take on a4. We could. But then queen b8, queen b8, rook b8, king d7, knight c2. Uh, it's difficult to develop my bishop because my rook will hang. Uh, we do have king c7, though. And this rook actually can't stay on the back rank. Ooh, that's interesting. Rook a4, queen b8, takes, takes, king d7. The knight has to be saved. Because other otherwise I'll take and then take his bishop. Then we can go like king c7 and attack his rook. But king 
that is kind of complicated. Bishop d6 looks a bit cleaner. We attack this pawn. We prevent queen b8 because we defend that square again. a4 is still hanging. This knight is still awkward. So, like, my opponent still can't castle. The most natural move looks to be d4. Also defending f4 because the bishop will open up. And then we can just castle. We're threatening moves like rook b8, rook a4. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. No need to overcomplicate this position. Of course, he could play a move like queen to b7. But I think we probably just take and then rook takes and just castle. Or we could even take on a4 because, again, rook b8 isn't playable because our bishop controls that square. And rook a4 would threaten the knight. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we could have taken on a4. But this just feels really, really clean. Like, no risk. Okay, now this looks very tempting because I don't see any drawbacks because queen b8 isn't playable. And if queen b7, then he's not actually threatening anything. He's threatening c6, but we can just take, take. Take, take, take. And then if he gives this check and takes my rook, then we have a check on h1 to win his rook. Sorry, that's a lot of arrows, I know. But I think this line works quite well. I think we can just take this. And then his knight is under attack. Knight c2. And then we can just castle. That looks good to me. He's, his position is just really bad. His knight is, you know, just cut out of the game completely. It has to reroute via c2. And then it's not even obvious where it's going. The bishop is locked out because of all his pawns on dart squares. His structure is horrific. Uh, loads and loads of weak pawns on like c3, f4, maybe f3. My opponent's disconnected. I hope he doesn't like just time me out because this is an interesting position to convert, I think. Because we're up a pawn and positionally we should be completely winning. We have the classic Karo Khan uh, central formation that is just so solid. Like, we haven't, we've had no problems with our center. The only way he could pose some kind of threat is like c4. But currently he can't do that because his knight is hanging. And like I said, you know, something like c4, bishop a3, queen b8, takes, takes, king e7. He has to take here, but then we take there and we have two pieces for a rook. Okay, he does go knight c2. I think castling is the obvious move here. Just getting our king out of safety. We've po we, we pocket the extra pawn. And now we just castle. I don't think he's got any threats. So let's just get out of there. If something like f5 is played, I think e5 looks very strong. The break apart is center. Uh, although his knight does defend it. There might be ideas of like sacking the exchange and going all in with some kind of kingside attack, especially with how strong this bishop is, if he tries to castle. But if he doesn't try to castle, what's this rook doing? Even if the rook goes to g1, it's not like he actually has an attack. Um, this bishop can't even get into the game properly with, like, bishop h6, and even if it did, it wouldn't be the end of the world. He'd have to sack a pawn with a move like f5, and then that, that would just open up the e-file anyway. So let's say he had two moves in a row with rook g1 f5. We could take, and after bishop h6, go rook e8 check into mezzo. And after the king moves, we can play g6 so that our rook isn't hanging on f8 after we go g6 because we give him a check on e8 first. And, I mean, that's obviously giving him two moves in a row anyway. Queen b6 is an interesting move. I guess he wants to trade and then attack c6. Okay. If rook b8, he can't take on c6 because he take his rook. So something like rook b8, queen c6, rook b1, he can't play a move like queen d8 check because we always have bishop f8 to defend. So the bishop is a fantastic defender in this scenario. If we go rook b8, of course he can't take because we have two defenders on the, G on the um, b8 square, so there's no back ranks. Rook b8, he could take the queen, rook takes, and if he trades again, then we just secure our extra pawn, and we're going to play a move like rook a2 to infiltrate. 
We could also play a move like knight h5 to go after f4 in that scenario. If we take, like, we're probably fine, but I just don't want to give him that activity. I feel like we're just giving him a bit of a gift there. Yeah, even though we could get a move like rook a2, got to move the knight somewhere. Let's say knight to e3. Well, then we take on f4, but like, I don't know. I think rook b8 is cleaner because he doesn't infiltrate. And like I said, uh, queen c6, rook b1, queen e8, bishop f8, we're absolutely fine. Yeah, I think rook b8 works. I think rook b8 works. You've got to calculate it, of course, but... Yeah, I like this move. I like this move a lot. He trades. Maybe he trades the rooks as well. I think he has to. And, yeah, it's just not simple for him. His best... Oh, he castles. That brings his king out of the action a bit. I feel like it needed to be more in there. Um... If we go rook a2, something like knight b4 goes after c6, that's kind of annoying. So maybe bishop back to d6 to prepare c5, which would be defended by the bishop. We could consider the move knight h5 to go after f4. I guess if knight to b4, we could always play a move like rook c7, but that's incredibly ugly. We could also play bishop d6 so that if knight b4, we could take it. This is not an easy conversion, in fairness. It's not fully obvious how to go about this. C5 is an interesting move. And then, like, after pawn takes, rook c7, hmm, rook e, sorry, bishop e3, bishop a7. But I don't like the fact that his rook can go to a square like a1 to try and back rank me. So, okay, knight h5, what do we think about that? If he advances the pawn, then we just take it. If he goes to remove like rookie one, we just go king f8. And then the knight's going to come into a square like f4 anyway. His pawns are also locked on dark squares, which are going to be targets for our bishop. If something like knight h5, knight b4 going after c6, that I don't love. Although if c6 falls, that's not actually the end of the world. Bishop f4. Bishop f4, knight f4, knight to c6, and then rook c7, and we win c3. Okay, that's interesting. Knight h5 looks pretty good to me. Uh, what else can he even play? Like I say, f5, we just take it and go king f8 if he tries to go onto the e-file to cover his infiltration squares. Um, knight h5, what else can he even do? I suppose he could play a move like bishop d2 and, I don't know, like, it would just be a waiting move though, because even if he gets a move like rook b8 in, we can just play g6 or king f8, we're not getting back ranked. Rook a2 I think would be a, well, it would just be a massive blunder because we'd get forked. I think what we want him to do is take it so that we can skewer him. I like knight h5, let's go for it. I know we're up a pawn, and I know that our opponent's structure is very bad, but we do have a weak pawn on c6. It's the only real weakness in our position, unless you also want to count the back rank weaknesses that we have, because our king obviously has no escape squares currently. So I want to try and tackle both of those problems, and if we can sacrifice the c6 pawn to win the c3 pawn and the f4 pawn, then of course that's a positive. And if we can do that while not allowing his rook to get too active on, like, the b-file and try to come into b8, that's also great. Okay, yeah, so he goes knight to b4. I don't love knight f4 because knight c6 comes with a fork, and that's messy. So bishop takes looks far better. Bishop takes, knight c6, just rook to c7. No worries. And if something like takes, takes, he could play a fancy move like rook a1, threatening mate if we take the knight, but we just play a move like g6 and give ourselves an escape square. So yeah, that is good. That is good. I was just considering the move c5 real quick, but it's 
completely unnecessary. It's just a waste of a move, really. Hope I'm not blundering anything. Final checks. Let's take. I'm happy. I think this is a very accurate way to go about this position. Also, after this trade on F4, we have hawking. We have um checking squares on E2 and H3, and the E2 one would be targeting D4 and C3 as well, which is a massive bonus. Of course, we don't want to take the bishop here because then he takes our rook. So rook c7 looks like the logical move. Yep. If um, knight to e5, of course you could consider taking, but then our knight actually just gets stranded because it can't go back to f6 because the pawn will be controlling that square. And these squares are obviously already taken up. Of course, we could go g6 to reroute back to g7 and then back into f5, but uh, I don't know. If knight e5 takes, 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 our knight isn't actually getting captured. It just seems unnecessary, although maybe it's very simple. If knight e5, bishop c1, rook c1, knight f4, threatening knight e2 check. Also threatening rook c3, rook c3, rook c3, knight e2 to be fancy in some scenarios. Okay, this makes our job very obvious. Now, yeah, this is kind of a threat. Obviously, we're attacking the knight. If knight e5, I think we can just take. I think we can just take, even if we lose the f7 pawn. Although we could start with f6 to give our king an escape square. And force the knight away. Oh, I like that. F6, knight g4 is the only move where the knight doesn't die. And then we just take on c3. We're threatening knight e2, knight d4. F3 is under attack. Yeah, let's do it. Our knight is also controlling d3, so we can't go back to d3. This is, I think, incredibly clean conversion. Um, I'll be interested to see if there was a more obvious or a simpler way we could have gone about this, but I honestly kind of doubt it. Also, with knight g4, rook c3, we're kind of threatening h5, because if knight f2, we can pick up f3, because the connection will be cut off. And if rook c3, h5, of course, you know, he does get to play a move in between. Uh, he can't go to e3, because our rook now controls that square. And the knight has no other places to go. But of course we just take this. You don't need to be worried about e6. Because our knight defends that for a start. And we're not getting back ranked. Because our king has an escape square. And his rook is also on f1 currently. h5, knight e3. Uh, it's not an obvious way to go about winning that. We could go rook to b2. Rook b2. Uh, it kind of just lets the king into the game. Rook d3 looks nice. Obviously the knight now can go to e3 if we play h5 because the king controls that square. I did consider h5, knight e3, and a move like knight h3 to try and deflect the king. But the king can always go to e2. And we don't have any useful check apart from just coming back. Rook d3 looks kind of annoying for white to deal with, so I'm going to play it. You do have to be careful because you're aligning your knight and rook. Well, you're aligning the rook with his knight in a way that he could get attacked, but obviously he can't go to either of those squares. Our knight defends this square, and the rook can't come to e4 to attack the knight because we control that. So I think we can just take on d4 and threaten knight d3 check. But yeah, we're just threatening knight to d3 check. And um, this is defended well. We're now up three pawns, and he's just going to give us the rook. So, fantastic. I suppose backwards knight moves just are difficult to see, I, I, I guess. It is a common sort of mantra in chess that backwards knight moves are the hardest ones to find. But, of course, that will end the game. Um, be interesting to see the computer analysis of this. I hope you guys enjoyed the game. I'd encourage you to stick around for the game review. And yeah, if you want to check out some of the other uh, episodes of this series, again, the playlist will be linked below. And let's get into the analysis.
Boys, 94.4% accuracy in the Karo Khan. That was, like, actually perfect. Like, accuse me of being a cheater. Obviously, I'm not cheating. You heard me explain why I was playing my moves, but... Whoa! That that was an amazing game. Damn. I think I, ha I, I had two inaccuracies all game. Two. And don't get me wrong, my opponent misplayed the opening. But, in fairness to him... You also got 83.2% accuracy, which is pretty high because it wasn't like it was a really short game or anything. You know, you get those short games where you get like, I think, um, Lavs, Lavs, you'll be watching this. Um, you put in the Discord, um, I think, uh, yesterday when I'm recording this, or it'll be two days ago when this video comes out, um, at least to everyone else, channel members do see it early. Um, but yeah, he got like 99.9% .9 because he just followed some um, like opening trap sort of thing. But it was like an actual game that wasn't just opening theory. So, you know, 83 is still pretty good. So fair play to my opponent. Yeah, my opponent starts with E4. Of course, we're going for a Karo Khan. F4, D5. And the computer agrees. Like, you have to go E5 because otherwise F4 makes zero sense. Absolutely no sense. E5 is the move. Don't get me wrong, like, this position is not good for white. It's just equal, as the evaluation bar seems to be saying, like, zero, zero, zero. And, you know, if, I, I think it is viable because you can kind of catch some Karo players out of theory with this line. But taking is just an inaccuracy. You know, on move three, it's just bad. And... You take back with the C pawn, of course, because you want to keep control over the light squares in the center and build around your D pawn. Again, my opponent should be trying to play D4, and it obviously, as the game develops, you see why D4 was so necessary, because us getting on this diagonal was so, so problematic for him. But the issue is, after, like, knight F6, bishop F5, E6, knight C6, bishop d6 or e7, those types of moves, we're going to have incredible control over the e4 square. White is just positionally worse because of it. And also we have um, the c file to work with. But yeah, he goes knight f3, we go knight c6. Of course you could have played bishop g4 in this position, but knight c6 just felt a little bit better. Typically you want to get the knight out before the bishop in these caro positions. And the computer agrees, actually. I don't... I think because of h3. Ah, right. So h3 makes this a bit of an issue for me because I can't retreat to h5 as I'm going to get trapped. This justifies the f pawn move. So I either have to retreat all the way back to c8 or d7, or I have to take the knight. And I just don't want to trade off my bishop like this for no reason. So we go knight c6 first. Bishop b5, bishop g4. If my opponent goes h3, again, I can't retreat. I do have to take. But, I don't know. I just have to play a move like e6. I go knight f6, bishop c5, maybe, castles. This is such an easy position. And my opponent still can't castle because queen b6 check picks up the bishop. So he has to give his bishop away. He goes c3, which is kind of just an odd move. And I was debating between a few moves in this position. e6 looked nice, knight f6 looked okay, rook c8 looked good, because um, I didn't like the prospect of queen a4 in some positions. Uh, and queen b6 also looked very good, because it did a lot of things in one go, as I described. I played it, it's the best move. Hopefully it makes sense as to why I played it. It's just a very active queen, and it's also not in any danger. Some, a lot of the time, you don't want to develop your queen too early because it, be, it can be kicked around by pawns, by minor pieces very easily, and your opponent can develop with tempo. Like, let's say this pawn was on d3 and this pawn was back on f2, then bishop to e3 would develop with tempo if this bishop was defended. But that's a lot of criteria that don't apply to this position. So he goes a4 to defend the bishop. I honestly thought a move like bishop e2 was better. Queen to a4, I have to take on f3, of course, because I can't allow a move like knight e5 with this kind of thing going on. 
He's got to take back, and his position is just bad. I was going to play a move like rook for c8, or knight f6, or e6 in this position. The computer does like a6. I don't see the point, because you're not actually threatening to take, because your rook would hang. So white can just ignore you. I suppose after you play rook c8, then it will be a threat. But personally, I would just want to switch the move order around and play rook c8 first. I don't know. Computers are going to be computers. a4 is played, defending the bishop. Makes sense. Bishop to e2 was better, but that is obviously quite passive, and I can develop very, very easily. e6, bishop c5 if he doesn't play d4. Maybe I would want to invoke d4, like entice him into playing it by going bishop c5, and then like dropping back to d6 so I can put a knight on e4. I don't know. We didn't get that though. a4 is played. I go knight f6. e6 was a little better, but we're just developing, whatever. Knight a3. Again, just very odd, very odd development. It made more sense to me to play a move like d4 followed by a knight to d2. Um, this just looked far more natural, something like this, or castling or something along those lines. And I think the computer does kind of agree with me. It always likes the move h3 because, well, I actually don't have to take because now if g4, bishop g6, he doesn't have f5 because my pawn helps defend. The computer just wants to take a ton of space and believes that it's absolutely fine, which I think is absolutely maniacal. But stockfish is going to stockfish. Knight a3. I explained the reason for this behind, well, the reason behind this in the game, and my opponent enlightened me to the reason of it by his next move b4, semi threatening a5 to attack my queen with his knight defending his bishop. I thought the idea was to rotate the knight to c2 to try and control the dark squares in the position, which I thought was unnecessary because I thought he was going to go b4 anyway. So it made more sense for me, to me, to put the knight from c2 onto e3 to attack my bishop. But he could have just played h3, and that would have done a good enough job. Anyway, knight f6, knight a3, we go e6. The computer does like a6. I didn't think it was necessary. And after takes takes, knight c2, e6. The position is just nice, I suppose. I guess the computer wants to force the issue here. I thought there's no need to force the issue. My opponent goes b4. Again, it justifies the move knight a3, but it's not the right idea. A lot of the time, hum humans tend to tunnel vision ideas. They go, okay, I've played knight a3 to defend my bishop so that I can push my pawn to a5 but i need to play b4 to defend the a5 square so that i can play a5 you've spent one two and potentially three moves just to attack my queen and a6 is the best move by the way and if you go a5 i'm just going to go back to a7 probably or queen c7 and like what have you acted what have you achieved like you just spent three moves on this really intricate plan to accomplish basically nothing. Did you, what, kick my queen off this diagonal? Like, big deal. You're going to have to take me here. And if you want to castle and justify your decision, like, cool, but currently f4 is hanging. So you probably have to play a move like d4 first to defend. Knight e4, castle, c3 is hanging, so you can't even castle yet. Let's say, I don't know, bishop d2, you can't really play because I'll take it probably. And after queen d2, I can then take here and double the pawns. Bishop d6, it's game over. I go a5, which was a bit inaccurate, apparently. Taking was the best idea. And I was torn between rook takes and queen takes. I think I wanted to go rook takes, but I didn't know if I could get away with it. After rook takes and rook b1, it looked a little bit scary. Okay, apparently knight e4 and I don't need to worry about anything. Because if you take here, then I just take. The bishop has no other useful discoveries. You know, so this is the computer's favourite line. I mean, a4 is under attack. My knight is amazing. You can't go d3 because the pawn hangs. Bishop may be coming out to c5. The knight's under attack. This pin is still very deadly. It's a horrible position for white. After a5, he takes on c6, though. Which was... Surprising. Take back with the C with the B pawn. Queen takes was apparently better, I guess, to keep the C file open so we can target C3. 
But I liked taking with the pawn because it stopped the knight coming into b5. I've what I tend to do when I play, I think, is I'm a little bit overcautious sometimes. I like to give my opponents zero chances. And quite a few people have said this to me when they've seen me play before. I like to just suck the life out of my opponent's position if I think that I'm better. If I think that I'm worse, then I will just lash out a lot of the time to try and create chances. I don't know if that's a good way to play. Like, I think I need to be a bit more objective sometimes. And if I'm in a better position, be like, look, they have this tiny bit of counterplay, but I have all of this. And I think I kind of achieved that in this uh, game when I took on A4. And I was like, look, I know you have some infiltration tactics or not tactics, but chances, but I don't think they work. So I'm trying to work on my game style. Anyway, BC6, BA5. We take with the rook. I think it's kind of interchangeable, to be honest. Queen takes or rook takes. I didn't want to take with the queen because I just allowed my opponent to castle. And I'm still winning. But why allow my opponent to castle? I decide on rook takes instead because I thought rook b1 was the most natural follow-up move. And then I can play queen to a7. And I, I, I loved this because I felt like my queen was an amazing piece. Controlling so many important squares, right? He goes queen b3. And I take on f3. Bishop d6 was playable. Uh, the computer slightly prefers it. It also likes taking on a4. I thought this was a little risky. King d7. Can he not go knight e5? Ah, king c7. Yeah, there were quite a few lines that I calculated in this sort of position. After bishop takes, pawn takes, which the computer likes just as much as taking the pawn on a4, really. I went bishop d6, which is the best move. Now, I did consider rook a4, and if queen b8, queen b8, rook b8, king to uh, d7, knight c2 saving the knight, king c7, and the rook can't stay on the back rank because I control all of the squares, so it's got to come back to a square like b3. And then I can just continue developing, you know, bishop d6. I'm just better. I could even just take here with the rook, although I think it's maybe unnecessary. Because um, I'm already up a pawn. I mean, like, rook takes, I don't know, d4. Then I can just take on f3 even though. So I did calculate this line. And, you know, you saw me calculate it during the game. But I thought bishop to d6 was just a bit simpler. Because... This pawn was going to fall anyway, and it did after I made this knight manoeuvre. But I just made life a bit more difficult for my opponent because he can't go queen to b8. He went d4. We took on a4. I thought there was no need to castle. We can just cash in now, and the computer agrees with me. It's the right time to cash in. I've stopped the major infiltration with queen to b8, and I'm about to finish my development, but there's no way my opponent can stop me from finishing my development. So just cash in. Rook a4. Of course, you need to calculate, but I didn't see an issue. After something like queen b7 in this position, I can just take, take, and take the knight. And if rook b8, king e7 takes, I can take here, because the rook doesn't defend this square. And then I just have two pieces for a rook. But it's far worse than that, because c3 is falling, f4 is falling, d4 is going to fall once c3 falls, and he has nothing. So I also calculated this line which meant that he had to go for a move like knight c2. I castle, queen b6. I thought this was quite a practical move from my opponent to go queen b6. I think it was a very nice find. Because if my opponent does something like castling here, I'm just going to play rook b8. And you've got to play a really ugly move like knight b4. c5 looks incredible here, because otherwise the queen has no escape. So queen b6 was a nice move. And I didn't want to take. This is the fifth best move. I've got, like, the lines, well, where my face is on my screen, right? This is good, but I have to play... No, not that move. I have to play a little bit passively to defend my position. And it's like, what's the need? I also want to facilitate exchanges. Rook b8 is apparently not the best move. Queen a8 is the best. Guarding and just keeping an eye on this, I guess rook b8 is coming anyway. Queen b7, trying to force my hand. And then I'm supposed to go queen to d8. Just avoiding a queen trade at all costs. 
I think what the computer is trying to say is that I'm going to have a winning attack if I can keep queens on the board. But from a human perspective, I'm up a pawn. My opponent's position is horrific. If I can just exchange queens in a favorable manner, which I do with rook b8, it might not be the best move, but I, I force this line. He has to go for this line. He has nothing else. Could have gone knight before. Um, he could have gone knight before here. But can I not just take c takes and then like he's just not enjoying himself whatsoever? Rook a4, bishop d2. I can just put my knight on a square like c4. Knight e8, knight d6, knight c4, I think is the idea. Or f5. Yeah. This just looks very comfortable. I could try and bring my king to d7 as well. But I could also just do nothing and go c5. I could go knight h5. There's so many different opportunities. He can't even move the knight really because I'll take his rook anyway. So there's no need to cash in with bishop takes too early. He takes, I think this was kind of forced to be honest. He castles, which was kind of surprising. I thought king to e2 was better. King d2 would have been nice, but that blocks the bishop's connection to f4. Uh, the computer agrees with me. Keeping the king in the center is definitely the better idea. I guess rook a2 does pin the knight to the king. But you can just go king d3, and your king's actually doing quite a good job. It's probably a bit harder for me to prove my advantage here, at least in my eyes. Castling, though, I think is kind of an automatic move for a lot of people. He spent the entire game trying to castle. But now it just puts his king in a suboptimal position. We go knight h5. The second best move, I think. The computer also likes just giving my king some space. But knight h5 all the same. Knight b4. And we take on f4 with the bishop. I didn't want to take with the knight because of knight c6. I just, like, every single one of my pieces is under attack. And I need to find rook a2 or rook a8. I think, oh, I could also go rook b7. But this is like an unnecessarily complicated line. And my opponent could potentially even draw this as well. Because his pawn structure is so bad, probably not. But being only a pawn down in a rook end game it is drawable. I think his pawn structure is too bad though. Um, So realistically, I wouldn't want to play that line. And rook to a2 apparently I need to go for. Knight e2. If the king goes here, then I take on c1 with check. But if he goes to h1, then I need to find rook a1. And the bishop can't move because the rook hangs. I mean, uh, it's just way too difficult. So bishop f4 is, well, it is the best move anyway, but it's just practically far easier to play. Knight c6, we go rook c7. Bishop f4, knight f4, and knight e5, which is a mistake. Rook b1 is better, and this is kind of what I expected. Just um, trying to bait me into taking the knight to give me back rank mate. And something like h6 or g6 looks fine here. Let's say g6 for the sake of keeping the pawn's aesthetic. Uh, something like rook b6, apparently. I could just slow play this position even. King g7. Although, can I not just do this and take? I think my knight is a little bit offside here. It doesn't have many squares to go to, which is what the computer's trying to say. But even so, you're just up two clean pawns. My opponent goes knight e5, and f6 is the best move because it forces knight g4, only move, and then it, again, keeps the line nice and simple. There's only a few things. There's only really one thing my opponent can do every move uh, leading up to this. He goes king f2, which is a good move. I go rook b3. Rook c2 was playable. But I thought like, I don't know, king e3. I need to find g5 or knight g2. Which just looks a bit unnecessary. I guess the point is to put the knight back here. I don't know. The, the pieces just look a bit loose. Rook d3 I thought was better. Because you just can't defend this. My pick goes rook e1. We take. And he just gives me his rook obviously. But even if he doesn't give me his rook like he did in the game, he doesn't have anything. Like, we're up three clean pawns. We're going to play a move like e5, move our rook, continue with like d4. We can throw in h5 if we want to give our king the h7 square 
and, I don't know, just take more space. It's obviously completely game over. I'm very happy with this game. I think it's a really good showcase of how positionally sound the Karo Khan is and how difficult it is to break down, you know? And then if you can just play normal chess, logical, you know, positional, tactical moves, then I'm not saying you're going to win every game, but I think it gives you simple positions to play, which I think is why I often score quite high accuracies in the Cairo Khan, because I think a lot of the moves, to an extent, play themselves. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you in the next one.